Uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a pleasant and restful weekend. Uh, my name is Izzy Greenberg. I run the Middlesex Coalition for Children. I am one of the co-chairs of the Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance. These calls are being sponsored by my organization, Middlesex Coalition for Children, by the Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance. We've got Meryl Gay here today from that organization, um, from CSEA, SEIU, and we have Ava Bermudez Zimmerman here uh, from the Connecticut Association for Human Services, and we've got Liz Frazier um, here today with us. So uh, welcome. We're so grateful you all could join us this morning, and thank you to those who had to rearrange things to join a little bit earlier. Um, we just make it work, right? Um, our guest today is Nathaniel Raymond from uh, Yale University, and um, we are going to be talking about um, public health and pu and safety um, during COVID for your childcare centers. So um, we did have Nathaniel on once before. We do have a recording of that. I will share the link to it in the chat. So if you missed that last time, uh, you can watch it. Although I think we'll probably get some updates on information today. So um, today would obviously be um, that last one was really great, really informative, and then today's is a is a nice. Um, sort of addition to it. So um, welcome, Nathaniel. Um, let me, real quick, I just want to say we will be using the Q&A. You're welcome to put questions for Nathaniel into the Q&A. Uh, if you have questions that are not for Nathaniel, please hold on those. Um, we can get to those after he is left. And um, so for now, Q&A will specifically be on um, public health um, related to your child care centers and opening them and staying safe. You are welcome to use the chat to share um, technical difficulties or to share information with each other. Um, for now, I am not going to allow for raised hands. Um, we've just had a lot of glitches with those, although we had a very successful um, story share last week. Um, but if you do want to ask a question um, live and you think that that is a better way, you are welcome to private chat me um, and I can call on you and, um, and allow you to, um, to join that way. So um, Nathaniel, welcome and thank you so much for joining us again. It's great to be here. So um, do, do you have some questions you'd like to start with or would you like me to give some updates? How would you like to proceed? I would say um, we do have questions, uh, but the best way probably to start is for you to update us on what's what's new and what should we know, what are the most pressing things you'd like for us to know, and then we can get into those questions afterwards. So uh, I'll start with good news. Um, the good news is we have increasing evidence uh, about the, um, the role of masks in uh, uh, preventing uh, spread of the disease even in an environment that's indoors with air conditioning with um, uh, asymptomatic spreaders. So we have a case study now out of a Starbucks in uh, South Korea uh, from uh, within the past month, which shows that employees uh, who practice uh, mask discipline uh, in an environment that was indoors with air conditioning did not become infected. Uh, 27 employees escaped infection, uh, while uh, a large amount of the customers in the store became infected. And this is just continuing uh, anecdotal and some quantitative data that's showing the importance of mask discipline when you are in an environment where infections are taking place. Um, this is consistent with the information from the case of what we call the Missouri super spreader, the woman at the hair salon, uh, who she and her clients had mask discipline when she was uh, highly contagious and she did not infect any of her 140 clients. Uh, so I just want to begin with, we, we know masks work. We know masks work more than ever. And we know they work in a scenario where uh, someone is not wearing a mask um, and is transmitting the disease, uh, there is strong evidence that you will be protected if you maintain mask discipline, even whether others are not. Um, that said, it's super important that you cover the nose. I am seeing all around town people wearing masks over their mouths, thinking that the mouth is somehow what you need to cover. 
if you had to choose between covering the nose and the mouth, you cover the nose. Um, and I want to be clear about this. I may have mentioned it before. We now understand why people are losing their sense of smell. It's because the pathogen actually is killing olfactory nerves in the nose. Um, and that loss of sense of smell is due to cellular death. Um, the nasal pharyngeal uh, uh, transmission uh, really needs to be prioritized. If you see people walking around with the mask like this, it's basically like you're not wearing it. So, um, and especially within uh, uh, minority communities, communities of color, when I've been driving around, I'm seeing a lot of people standing very close with their masks like this. You have to have a seal on the nose. So let's talk about masking in our good news category, masking in children. Children under two should not be wearing a mask. There is, um, and this is CDC guidelines, there is risk um, with a child under two wearing a mask. Children above the age of five, and this was a question I think you forwarded to me, Izzy, um, can wear a mask indoors like anyone else. And uh, it is really important if you're dealing with um, multi-generational housing where someone may be exposed or infected, um, that there is consistency in terms of mask wearing, both in how you wear it and consistency in who's wearing and not wearing a mask. Um, so the standard rule of thumb here is children over five. Yes, um, they can wear a mask indoors and should. So good news is masks work. We know that more than ever. Okay, here's bad news. Um, we have stats this morning from the American Academy of Pediatrics that really the trajectory of this disease is shifting in the United States and it's shifting towards children. So what we know now is that we are seeing basically in data that's been compiled between May 21st and August 20th from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, we're looking at a shift of this disease to younger and younger cohorts. What that means in English is that uh, kids are becoming really primary transmitters and primary infected population. Um, just uh, one of the uh, critical stats here is that we've seen during this time period a 720% spike in uh, case uh, positive rates amongst children. We've seen a 356% spike in hospitalizations among children. And we've seen a 229% spike in deaths. So I, my, my key piece of bad news here is that uh, for those of you in the child care industry, you are on the front lines of where the transmission is moving. And as we look at the reopening of schools, including universities, in that we are seeing a, a lot of factors all happening at once that probably are gonna continue to drive transmissions, um, which are decreasing nationally, by the way, but they are increasing. And we think that the opening of schools are going to increase the percentage of those decreasing national transmissions that are in individuals under 24. And so we use that under 24 because different states have different ways of counting young adults and counting children. Um, so that those are two big headlines. The last thing is we are making major progress towards an FDA um, uh, a series of FDA emergency authorizations for at-home saliva testing. The Yale uh, saliva test um, developed my, by my colleagues at the School of Public Health has received um, an emergency use authorization. And that means that people can use basically the recipe developed at Yale to build these saliva test kits, which 
the best way to think of them is they're, they look and act very similar to pregnancy tests, but instead of urine, they use saliva. And um, we are going to see probably in the next three to six months, those home test kits be available to you. Um, when we get to saliva testing and the paper strip home kits, we're gonna be in an entirely different universe. Um, that will allow us a tempo of testing and an ability to quickly isolate infected, asymptomatic infected people that we don't have now. So we're gonna look back on this time once we get to the paper saliva tests and say a before and after. We're gonna be able to move much more quickly and we are gonna really, I think, drive that rate down. Um, until we get there, however, uh, we are gonna really have to rely on prevention as our, our main um, available strategy. And that means discipline on the mitigation efforts. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Ezzy, but those are the key things I wanted to communicate. Great, um, thank you. So I, uh, I wanna, the things that I think we learned last time um, were that ventilation, fresh air intake, and mask wearing were the best known preventative measures. Do you stand by that still? Is that up the update? I do. We have one update on social distancing that six feet may not be enough. Is that with and a mask? Yes. So stay with a mask. Children can't do that. <laughs> so that's part of our part of the issue. And, the ha, ha, you know, what are, are is anyone actually effectively maintaining a 10, to, 10 foot distance with four year olds? Um, no. <laughs> and uh, there was a tweet from my colleague, Jeremy Conandek, who is the former deputy administrator of USAID, US Agency for International Development, was one of the leaders of the 2015 Ebola response who had this great tweet about the <laughs> Alabama outbreak that now has over, I think, 1,500 infected students, um, maybe significantly higher than that. Jeremy said, what a surprise that our strategy of asking college students not to behave like college students didn't work with preventing transmission amongst college students. So yeah, that, that's <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is that the evidence that six feet may not be enough um, doesn't mean that we try 10 and 20 foot exclusion zones with children. It does mean, however, that mask discipline and ventilation become even more important. Um, don't abandon social distancing, but see social distancing within the context of what that six feet may not be enough news really means, which is that the droplet range of the aerosol um, may be wider than we expected. That's what that's saying. And so it just means that you have to put more emphasis on mitigating the potential spread of the aerosol. And that is mask and velocity of air and refresh through ventilation. And to be clear, did you say social distancing uh... If both parties are wearing masks, do you still need to be 10 feet apart? Or is that is it the mask sort of makes that? The, the, the mask significantly reduces it. And if you can imagine, um, and there's some visualizations you can see online of this, is that if you have two people who are masked, there's almost no visible droplets if you use um, ultraviolet light to look at the, um, the dispersal. Um, if one person is not wearing a mask and one person is, you can see small droplets dispersing um, from the maskless person, but you do not see them coming in contact with the nasal uh, pharynx or the oral pharynx of the other person. Um, okay. So masks, masks matter. Um, get as far away as you can, but with kids, it's not gonna be possible. So ventilation is still your front line of defense. Does it matter how well the mask fits or if you're wearing glasses that don't allow anything to come into the eyes? Um, I mean, I see a lot of people with masks that you know have gaps on the sides. Like, does any of that really matter or is it just like put something over your face because that's where the primary flow is? Uh, 
something is better than nothing, but um, we, we do have science on this. We have um, a great article, I believe, uh, I think it's Lancet in terms of uh, review of masking materials. Um, that, as I said before, if you can um, switch your mask out regularly, um, then use disposable, both a, a surgical mask or an N95. If you cannot, then use a cloth, two ply, and you want to get the seal. Okay. I mean, the, the, the critical thing is having what I call the goldfish with the sides out like that, um, better than nothing, but not as good as having that, that seal. You're wanting to both prevent you from emitting from this area and prevent from receiving in that area. Got it. And the N95 is fine, but the ones with the little like ventilation hole or whatever that valve, those are bad, right? Don't even mess with it. Right. Just want to be clear. Yeah. Um, um, I see a lot of people using the, the ventilation valves with the replaceable discs. Um, those are, are only good if you can ensure that you can be at a professional standard of filter replacement. I, I think I recommend that people don't even mess with it. Um, just because um, it means making sure you have that filter constantly replaced. Right. Um, so one of the things that we got a lot of um, pushback on last time was this idea that um, this virus potentially is hitting African American and Latinx populations harder in a way that goes beyond social determinants of health. And um, from what I understand, I just want to make sure we're clear about this, that that your impression was that those communities should be especially protected because there seems to be some link between like a similar thing to the sickles, the way sickle cell interacts in the body, that this affects people um, beyond just social determinants of health and that understanding and knowing that helps to have a vaccine that works for everyone. Yes. Um, white people um, or not just those less prone to sickle cells types of things and I know that's probably I'm using this these terms less scientifically than I should but I want our community to understand because there was a lot of questions that arose from that conversation last time. Let me um, say one sentence clearly. Positive we, have, we have enough evidence to know that there is a genetic factor at play here yeah. and that requires us morally <laughs> Uh, as um, public health professionals, and I don't call myself a, a scientist per se, but as a public health professional that teaches response, um, it is essential for us to understand that because now that we are in a vaccine development phase, let me give you one example of why this matters so much. We need a vaccine that is generalizable and representative to all the communities that are affected by this virus. If we do not have in a uh, stage three trial, a vaccine test population that includes all communities, particularly African-American and Latinx communities, and if we don't have a vaccine, or should I say vaccines, that can be used by all of those communities to an equal standard of protection, then we are fundamentally leaving Latinx and African-American communities exposed exposed. And so we have enough evidence right now um, to, to know that we have genetic factors that are increasing susceptibility. We know that. How the mechanism by which is not resolved. Is it happening? Yes, it is happening. And so we have to build our strategy with this pathogen as it relates to vulnerable communities communities of color in this country. We have to have four aspects. One, social determinants of health, as we talked about before. The second is the, the right research to understand genetic and biological factors so we can protect these communities through vaccine design. Um, third is developing the, um, and I'm using a public health term here, we call them surveillance systems. It does not mean NSA or Edward Snowden or that stuff, but systems of data collection to understand vulnerability and susceptibility in these communities. And fourth, 
front end loading resources to the places where we need the testing, the mitigation to be prioritized. So that's how we're gonna beat this thing by seeing all four of those factors. One of those factors is genetic and biological links. We know that. What we do not know is exactly how that mechanism works, hmm. but we do know it's happening. And, and is it still also apparent that this seems to be affecting men more, uh, more seriously than women? Or in different um, I, would say, I would say broadly, yes. But as I said before, at the beginning of the call, we are seeing the epidemiology, the sort of the patterns here, they're starting to change. Yeah, okay. And so one thing to bear in mind is that what it looked like at the beginning and what it looks like now is different. One thing has not changed, which is that um, communities of color, though the, the age um, cohort is changing, communities of color are still being disproportionately affected. We know that. And it's really important um, that we, we respond um, to how the transmission pattern is changing. That said, we aren't seeing so much of a change in terms of what communities are being most devastated and what communities have the highest mortality. As morbidity is changing, fine, but mortality is still very focused. And this is true in Connecticut um, within the past week. And it's true nationally that it's primarily communities of color that are disproportionately experiencing fatalities. Right. Okay, we have, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, we've got a lot of mass questions. So um, one was that we learned last time that um, the virus loves humidity. So is being outside on humid days, on humid days, excuse me, uh, riskier? Or is it still outside is safe no matter what the outside humidity is? Outside is safe. Okay. Um, it's, about, it's about humidity and indoor environments. Okay. Um, so some things we've seen that are being studied to try to understand this is we've seen a large fatality cluster in Mexico City in a giant walk-in freezer at an uh, indoor market amongst tomato salesmen. Huh. A large amount of tomato salesmen have died after, it appears, exposure in an indoor freezer environment. We're trying to understand, particularly as we head into winter, how humidity in cold environments um, relates to transmission. Because we are not seeing uh, a ceiling and a floor in terms of heat and cold that's killing this thing. Okay. And, and, but we are, we are seeing um, relationship to what basically adherence to particles. It's getting sticky with stuff in the air. And that seems to happen in cold environments and seems to happen in hot environments. Um, to be very clear, outdoors on a humid day does not seem to be any different than outdoors on a dry day. What we're talking about with humidity is indoor humidity. And if kids so are- I, I, I see people running humidifiers, that's a bad idea. Okay. If kids are playing outside on, a, on, a, on, a, on any day, uh, it, are the masks necessary or is outdoor space a time when they could take a mask break? That's a good question. Um, I, and I'm, I'm trying to answer this from the, from the, the, basically the pragmatic perspective of really what's going to work. Um, I, I think it's what type of play are they doing? If they are playing, close proximity and there's a lot of physical contact like they're in the sandbox they're climbing on top of each other on the jungle gym you want a mask if they are playing a a running game um if they are doing like soccer um then I, and i i don't want to call for lax mask use but if you had to choose yes. if they are on top of each other masks on if they are running and playing tag, then you can allow them to take the masks off, but you, you've got to be watching them like a hawk. Um, the key thing is you don't want them in each other's face. It, when we see the plexiglass at a store, that only matters if 
um, someone spitting in your face. Now with kids, <laughs> that's a scenario where, yeah, they could be spitting in each other's face or having that dispersal. So, um, I mean, this is a tough call for me, but you have to be the judge, which is unfortunate. The main thing is that um, if they're moving and grooving and they have velocity, they're probably not dispersing. Okay. Um, yeah. What time do you have to log off? I want to make sure I'm watching this clock. I have a half an hour. Okay, thank you. Um, is it possible to become positive up to two weeks after exposure? How quickly after exposure should you know if you're sick? Um, usually we're, we're seeing a 72 hour to 10 days. Okay. Um, for, so for preschoolers who wear masks, if they need to be removed for eating and napping, should a clean mask be put on instead of the one used earlier? Do we risk contamination if the child has already used that mask and taken it off? Um, or can they, you know, drop it down at their neck, take their nap? I guess necks aren't safe for children. Let me not say that. But can they take it off, put the same mask back on, or does it really need to be a fresh mask after eating or sleeping? Ideally, if you can fresh mask, fresh mask, but they can reuse the previous mask if there isn't a better option. Um, okay, so kids three to five, um, that is the kind of sweet spot for us on this call. Um, the idea is under two should not be wearing them, but between three and five should be wearing them. And to be clear, our, our children in that age cohort, in terms of like viral load and, and spread and all those things, are children as susceptible to catching it? And are they as susceptible to spreading it? Like if the school directors are having really hard time getting those children three to five to wear masks, should they, I mean, obviously the adults will all have masks on. Sort of how far do you go? And, and, and how important is it that that age group be wearing them to keep everyone safe? Uh, the evidence is evolving very quickly here. Um, I don't think we're disaggregated in our data to a three to five, that two year period. But we do know that once you get to 12 to 13 and over, um, they are behaving more and more like adults in terms of viral load and transmission. When we are under that and the lower we go, we're seeing um, lower rates of transmission. Um, still some very disturbing numbers in terms of viral load, but viral load doesn't mean um, risk of transmission. And so we're, we're seeing with, with these younger kids, yes, they are, are less, um, uh, they're, they're less virulent spreaders than older kids and adults. That is true. That's okay. what the evidence suggests. Um, that, does that mean we should, uh, you know, uh, a small, <laughs> A, a, a grenade <laughs> versus a car bomb <laughs> in terms of viral load. They're both explosive. Um, but one, uh, yes, has less transmission capability than the other. Right. Um, and then is the droplet range as big for small children? Do they need that more than six feet? Or like, are they not powerful enough to spread it in that way? I can't evaluate that. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that uh, one of the things that increases droplet range are the activities that you do. Um, the most um, uh, worrisome ones are singing and shouting. We have uh, multiple examples of choir practices um, without any HVAC, uh, any indoor air conditioning, infecting large amounts of people in a room because they were singing together. And this relates to kids in the sense that kids like to sing and shout <laughs> and be loud together. Um, those activities without a mask are basically creating an environment where the human body is behaving like the air conditioning. It is blowing the, the particles um, and singing and shouting do that very, very well and three to five year olds sing and shout very, very well. And I should say, this is really, we're talking about two to five year olds, I misspoke. So under two should not wear a mask, but from the time you turn to and up that a mask is recommended? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, two, two year olds and under, it's considered a risk. 
for potential suffocation. Until you're three. Uh, until, you're, until you turn three? Is that, I just want to be clear, that the, year. The, the guidance is, is uh, three and above uh, masking. So how do you keep those children under three safe if they're not wearing masks, just by everyone else wearing masks and having good ventilation, you hope for the best? Um, that, that is currently what is available to us. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, the, so I'm saying that's what is available to us. Does that equal safety? I can't say that. Yep, understood. Um, so in terms of humidity, should people be running dehumidifiers in their spaces if they have them? Like if the air conditioner has a dehumidify setting, you know, should they be using those kinds of things? Um, I think what they should be, don't focus on controlling humidity, focus on controlling air exchange. Okay. So, uh, you know, th this is the thing is that your, your number one priority in terms of ventilation, the number one thing you can do to best effect is getting positive air exchange with a good airspeed going in your space. Now, if people are considering de dehumidifier use because they're not able to control their windows and their air exchange, um, that then we, we need to go back to the main problem, which is how do we work with landlords, with people who control the physical infrastructure that we're in, to try to get that air exchange and that velocity. Does that make sense? We, we've got to stay on the, the primary problem. Um, I think managing humidity is significantly less important than managing air exchange and velocity. Do air filters fall into this same kind of category? Yeah, so we're learning some things on air filters. Um, what we're learning is that, um, the size of this particle is 0.125 microns. Um, what that means is that a uh, HEPA filter catches it. That is good. Um, MERV 13s and filters in that family um, that are very common in schools um, probably do not catch it. Now, um, the fact of the matter is that um, we don't know everything we need to know about filters. We know more than we did a month ago. Um, the main thing is that if you have a, filter, a filtration system, it should be clean. <laughs> it should be um, up to date in terms of new filter put in, whole system cleaned and washed. A fil any filter is better than no filter. Let's put it like that. Okay. So don't try to get the perfect filter. Do try to have a filter. Um, and then what if, let's see, if your air conditioning, if let's say you are um, not making any headway with your landlord, the air conditioning system, and I guess that probably will become the heating system at some point soon. Um, if it doesn't vent to the outdoors, should you just, down and you and open the windows like what's the I mean are you just sitting in a virus cooker otherwise so I'm working with colleagues at an organization called last mile that are working with a series of unions nationally to create a Spanish language guide around ventilation and workplaces and one of the areas we're focusing on is uh, child care and we're going to make this guide available to you um, I am the, the, the person they're waiting on to finish edits on it. So we hope to have it um, ready to go this week. And I'll send it to you, Izzy, and you can share it with everyone. Um, uh, the reason I bring this up is, A, this is going to be a great resource that you can have. It will be in Spanish. It will have illustrations. And we will have online on Instagram and other social media platforms a series of visualizations about masks, about social distancing, and about ventilation um, that we think will be helpful. Okay, here's why I bring it up, is we've had a large debate in writing this about um, the very question you just asked. If you are not in control of your HVAC, but you can open a window, 
what do you do? And what we've decided, and it'll be reflected in the guide, is that the best thing you can do is get the windows open. And if you can develop basically an airflow where you put a box fan in one window, <laughs> blow, blowing in and another blowing out. Um, so th that's, that's what we've come down on in terms of if you feel that you do not control your air, but you can get the windows open, and it is, and you're not going to be freezing your family or the children in your care. Um, get that airflow. Now, I want to be very, what, why I was a stickler on that is because very soon it's going to get cold. Yeah. And, and we are hitting, and I'm going to use some fancy terms and then I'll translate it. We're hitting what we call a, um, a twin demic or a double nexus which is we're entering flu season while we have continuing COVID transmission. And so we're dealing with this um, situation uh, of, of a balance of consequences now on these decisions where exposing ourselves to the outdoors may prevent COVID, but it may increase flu and cold susceptibility. And so we're entering a very difficult phase. And so the good news here is that if we can get the saliva tests up and going by the heart of this winter, that will be the most effective thing rather than trying to control environments. It's identifying spread is significantly okay. more effective than people jerry rigging a wind tunnel. Yeah. with box fans in December. Yep. Um, but until we have that saliva test, you will be Jerry rigging a wind tunnel with box fans up until December. And yeah, so, so somebody said they're in a church basement, there's no air conditioning and they can't open the windows. Do they use fans? Do they not open? I mean, I guess the wind tunnel box fan scenario may be the best thing. If, if they can get an airflow in there, get the airflow in there. Yep. I mean, th this is what we've come down to is this one sentence, air on the side of, excuse me, air, <laughs> da, 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 excuse the pun, um, focus on air exchange as your number one priority. Okay. How you do it, I don't know, but try. All right, what about, um there was a report that UV light sanitizing lamps in your filter can be useful. Is that something that is recommended in any way? It, what's difficult about the UV issue is we, we don't know what the tempo and scale of the UV lamp um, needs to be to have it be fully effective. Uh, so if you have access to one and one is professionally installed in your HVAC system, um, hallelujah, that's great. Um, the fact of the matter is we don't have the same quality criteria on that that we are developing now on filters. So we know HEPA filters um, are a size to particle match that works. We know there's some issues on MERV. I can't speak with the same confidence on UV. So in terms of the flu vaccine, what, is there any recommendation, if, if, is this year any different? Like when should people be getting the flu vaccine? As soon as possible. Get it, get it, get it, get it. So, so one thing that I was, I just had this conversation. Um, I just got mine. CVS offered it to me in the drive through lane. And someone else said, boy, that was irresponsible of you to get it because it only lasts three months and it's going to hit you at the worst time. And I don't know if that's, and I was going back and forth thinking there's logic to both of these things. So, you know, is getting it now going to make you more vulnerable in the heart of the winter or just get it now and, you know, what happens later? The public health guidance from CDC and HHS is get it now. Okay. Uh, we, we, um, we don't, public health is not about predicting the future. It is about forecasting, which is not the same as prediction, um, forecasting uh, to the best, uh, the, the best minimum viable strategy. 
uh, what the data recommends. And right now, get your flu vaccine is the best recommendation. So someone's saying that getting the flu vaccine can also depend on your age. Uh, is that? Um... Yeah, and it, you, you go to your doctor, you go to CVS, they are going to know um, whether there's a age issue or a comorbidity issue, and they're not gonna give you the vaccine if there is. Um, are oscillating fans effective if that's all you have? Should, does it have to be a box fan? Just any fan, air movement in general? Yeah, I mean, some movement is better than no movement. Great. More movement is better than less movement. Um, and even if you do not have access to an open window, getting things moving in that enclosed space is better than having it be stagnant. Um, hold on, Liz, it looks like you have a question. Go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, I just want to debunk something possibly so that people don't start um, looking into it. There's been this thing about burning alcohol, alcohol candle burners that destroy the virus. It seems like it is all bogus. No, don't but do that. I just wanted to make sure because I just saw it yesterday and before people start having people trying to sell them these things. I just wanted to see what the, uh, the, the science is. No, we have no science on it. So in the absence of science, don't do it. That's really very helpful. Yeah. That's, you know, they're gonna start coming up with these things that are going to um, stop this virus. And we wanna make sure it's only the science that we listen to, so. We're, yeah, right now, we, we know what stops this virus covering your nose and mouth, getting air exchange, getting air flow, keeping the distance that you can keep. The, that This is a respiratory virus through aerosol spread. It is not, does not seem to be um, a surface spreader. It does not seem to be um, anything other than a, a severe respiratory aerosol droplet pathogen. And so that means masks, distance, get the air moving. So can until you- Until we've got okay. test and vaccine. So can you talk, there was another question in here since you just mentioned it on surfaces and cleaning and, you know, there we, obviously childcare centers clean all the time anyway, but can you talk about the surface piece since you just mentioned it? Yeah, I mean, um, you should be washing your hands. You should be using hand sanitizer. Is that the primary means of attack here on this thing? No, the data does not suggest it. Um, if you think back to the beginning of the outbreak, um, CDC was not calling for masks and they were saying, wash your hands, wash your hands. Now it's mask, mask, mask. Oh yeah, you should wash your hands too. Um, so here's the term, fomite. Um, uh, fomite is the term we use to refer to surface transmission. Um, this does not appear to be causing super spreader events through people touching a surface. It's happening through ingestion through your nose and mouth. It's not the, the amount of, of particles that you need to get into your system to get infected is not coming off your hands like this. Is this bad? Yeah, this is, don't be doing this. Don't be putting the fingers in up here, but is this the primary transmission vehicle? No, it is not. It is the air and its particles. So the, the way you think about it here is what do you prioritize in your childcare center? You're prioritizing air, you're prioritizing facial coverings. You are not, becoming the um, hand sanitizer um, enforcer, okay, at the expense of mask enforcer. Enforce the mask, enforce the air, hope and encourage hand washing. But we're not living and dying on hand washing here. Uh, okay, so what about plexiglass shields, which are being used in some places? Are those effective at all? I mean, if, we, you as said- As I said before, if someone's spitting in your face, yes. Okay. Um, at, at, this, at this level, when you're in 
uh, if you're intubating someone in an ER, if you are facing someone who is not masked or improperly masked and they are in close proximity and potentially emitting saliva droplets into your face, yes, you want the plexiglass there. Um, I see people walking around who are not having that type of contact, who have a mask and a shield um, in a grocery store, fine. Um, it's not bad, but the, the main issue where the plexiglass matters is close proximity of droplet spray within a foot. Right. So if, if you're changing a baby and the baby sneezes on you because of the temperature change from the wet diaper to the air without a diaper on, you might want to wear a face shield. Yes, that is an example where you are coming in close proximity to something that's emitting droplets. Yes, understood. Um, and, okay. and this reminds me, speaking of, of dirty diapers, um, one of our most effective monitoring tools right now is wastewater surveillance. Um, just this past week, a cluster was observed and interdicted, was stopped. Um, at Arizona State University through the use of wastewater measurement. And uh, it really, um, just, just to watch where things are going, as we get a handle on this, two of the critical tools are gonna to be the saliva test, and the, uh, I talked about the home test, and also um, giant population monitoring tools like wastewater. And that's starting to come online in some communities here in New Haven and um, in Connecticut, where I think we're going to be seeing municipalities being able to see um, large population spreads better than we could a month ago or three months ago. So that's another piece of good news that's happening. Um, so if somebody writes in, in a family setting, which is typically in a home, um, if there's children that are, you know, a sick, so many different ages. So we've got babies in the, you know, 12 to 15 months, there's four year olds, there's a great number of kids, it's in a home. <laughs> um, in terms of keeping people distant, I mean, it doesn't, if that is not really super possible in a home setting, we're again, just going back to masks and ventilation. Um, does, does keeping the children of different ages into in separate rooms have any impact or like the, the air is shared so it wouldn't seem like it would? I just want to be clear about it. Um, that's a good question. I, this is the first time I'm thinking about the issue of different ages of children in a multi-gen setting. Um, most of the thinking that I've been engaged with on multi-gen is elders in a home with children. Um, and this doesn't answer your question. I don't, I need to think about this. Um, but our main focus has been keeping the elderly and comorbid populations, those with a disease, a pre existing condition, away from the kids to protect the elder population. In terms of separating age groups of children, um, into different cohorts. I don't think we have good at-home guidance on that. Um, that's something I will focus on with the guide. Okay, great, thank you. I mean, yes, a lot of our centers might have preschoolers in one classroom and um, toddlers in another classroom and infants in another classroom. And sometimes they end up sharing spaces. Some, some are in groups together. Um, so we definitely have birth to five in the same building, in the same air conditioning zones, um, and potentially in the same rooms. So that would be useful. We, um, we, are, we are seeing 12 to 13 and above being one cohort of transmission that's more like adults. Okay. And underneath that 12 to 13, that, that is a different cohort. And I don't want to draw some magical red line, yep. but I'm just saying that you should really focus on if you have to divide them, you've got your 13 and above group and your 13 and under group, if you have to set a line. Does that make sense? 
we don't have a lot of 13 year olds probably in our settings, but there's some and certainly as schools are going on hybrid models and families are looking for childcare, we're going to have a lot more school age and middle school children potentially in some of our centers. And so this will become a bigger issue. So if there are centers that have have typically served under five year olds, but now may be taking in some school age children, is it best to keep those populations separate, both for bubble, because those students may be in an actual school Monday and Tuesday, and then be in this childcare facility Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so there's a bubble break yes. there. Um, but, but is there also kind of like because of age and the way they spread it, should those populations be kept separate if possible? Both the behavior pattern of those older children and what we're seeing in terms of differences in transmission, yes. Okay. If, you ha if you have to draw a line and you are having those older kids in with the younger kids, separate them, yes. Okay, um, do people need to th rethink it? If they got a flu shot now, do they have to also plan for another one in three or four months? Um, there will be national guidance at that time from CDC, follow that guidance. Okay, thank you. Um, and how about temperature checks? Uh, are, we've, we're hearing they're less accurate, um, but it's also, we're dealing with children. Um, uh, should we stop doing it? Is there a, a reason to do temperature checks? You should do temperature checks if they are required by the state or your, your, or your municipality. Frankly, I feel um, that the term I use is um, a term that was popularized after 9-11 with um, the TSA in terms of pre preventing plane hijackings, which is security theater. Um, I feel that the use of temperature checks is public health theater that is often used um, in the absence of a, a best practice comprehensive response. Um, and here's why, is that the, those that we're most worried about are not symptomatic at all. And so, um, frankly, temperature check um, tells us that, that someone is at this part of the curve of the infection cycle. Um, and that's good to identify them, but in terms of preventing the main spread we're concerned about has no relationship to that. So does that mean that it's not a useful diagnostic? It may have some use, but it is not um, the, the question is whether, it, it, is it about optics or about what it actually tells us? It's more about optics. Yeah, there was a great um, article I read about hygiene theater and that a lot of this surface cleaning and the, these kinds of things that are happening are meant to make people feel better, but they're actually doing very little in terms of protection. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's the same with a lot of the surface cleaning, like do your normal surface cleaning, but you don't need to go crazy with it. Don't go crazy. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we've only seen quantitative evidence that one strategy really, really works. And that's masks, <laughs> masks and distance. Um, we, have, we have seen no quantitative evidence that suggests that um, nuking every surface in your facility with um, hand sanitizer is the key to success. Okay. Um, and so in terms of, if, if a family is saying, you know what, for whatever reason, my child can't wear a mask, do, does the center need to say, you know what, maybe that child can't come to school? Or, or like how, how strict is, are the recommendations around this? It's hard, in absence of a mandate from the state, it's very hard for our um, providers and centers and educators to be strict on parents, because parents are saying, well, the governor's not saying I need to do it, or Office of Early Childhood's not saying I need to do it. Um, and I guess this, the people on this call are wondering, how, how strict do we need to be without that state mandate? We, we know um, from decades of public health research that shaming, that um, aggressive confrontational strategies with individuals who either think they can't or won't or, or shouldn't um, participate in the public health strategy, the, the more aggressive you get, the less it works. Um, so let's step back from 
from the specific issue of a mask, when you encounter a parent who is saying um, no, or I can't, or you have to make an accommodation, the main thing is to have a conversation with them that's not in public, um, that's, that's about listening to them and having them explain where they're coming from on the issue. I think uh, on the question of masking, you want to do a quick diagnostic about whether we're talking here about an issue of literacy on the part of the parent, public health literacy, or that there's a real issue here. Um, for example, and I'm just making this up, but child has a deviated septum. Um, child has severe asthma, respiratory issue. What you're gonna find when you've got a real issue about masking is that actually there's a larger comorbidity here, which means that even with a mask, they should not be in an exposure environment. Right, okay. Does that make sense? So I, I would say that you're gonna winnow the hey, we don't want to mask our kid into three baskets. One, there's a real issue, and you need to find out what it is, and they probably shouldn't be there anyhow. Second, um, there's resistance that doesn't have to do with the kid and more with the parent. <laughs> right. um, and, and then, well, that may be a judgment call where, okay, if you're not going to do what's right for your kid and your community, we don't want you to come on in. And the third is, education may actually make this issue go away. Yep. Find out what it is. Okay. Um, and just for clarity, if people are holding crying children, assuming they're also wearing a mask, should they have face shields? Um, yeah, I think if you have um, plastic glasses and you're covering the ocular cavity here, um, uh, that, that's best. Um, a whole, Holding anything that is unmasked in dispersing particles, that's when, back to Merrill's point, that's when the face shield matters. Okay, this is, I know you have to go, and so this is my last question, but people have a lot of questions here about um, the tests, um, how long it does, is there a difference in how long it takes to come back for children versus adults, um, and how effective, like should people be testing, should teachers be having tests, should, should parents be having tests, um, and, and if a child has a fever, does that child need to have a test before coming back or do they just quarantine for two weeks and then they are, you know, what's the guidance on that? Um, first, um, no, there's no difference between a child's test and an adult's test in terms of turnaround, to my knowledge, no. Second, yes. <laughs> And um, it should um, teachers and, and students be having tests? Everyone should be tested to the degree that they can access it. Um, and your local system will tell you what's available. Um, the, the, the last thing I would say here is that fever is a very important symptom. Um, if you are seeing, um, if you have a fever that is sustained, and you can get the specific guidance on this on the CDC site, um, that should be taken very seriously. That combined with dry cough are two of the most clear symptoms of potential COVID infection. Okay, um, and, and I think we're in this for the long haul. So, so this is kind of stuff people should be preparing for for the next while, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm increasingly hopeful, and I'm, I'm hopeful, oh, I've got a, a large dog here. Um, I'm increasingly hopeful because I believe that the, um, <laughs> and this is the, the sound that it's time for me to go here, um, <laughs> but the, uh, but what I'm hopeful about is that I think with wastewater detection and saliva-based home tests and quicker um, at work tests, that we are um, approaching a moment where we're going to be able to see um, micro changes in transmission at the community level. And we're, we're gonna be there within the next three months. And in the absence of a vaccine, that is, that's the game changer. Next year, I think we are on trajectory to have um, 
some form of combination of vaccine and, and increased um, improved treatment options and multiple treatment options. We're already getting there. Um, so s mentally, you guys need to lock in here and what I would say is three month, um, little three month spurts. The next three months are gonna be like it is now. I think within three months from that, we're gonna see some change. Within six months, we're gonna see more change. So let's continue to check in um, and I'm gonna get you that guide. And we're thinking in little three month bites here. Um, okay. It's hard, but it's gonna get better. The, the arrow is pointed in the right direction. Excellent. I know you've got to go. Thank you so much for your time this morning. We will hopefully do this again um, and uh, have a great day. Thanks so much, Nathaniel. We're very grateful. Thank you, everyone, for everything you're doing. Bye, guys. Bye. Okay. Uh, we actually got through everyone's questions. I honestly can't really believe that. <laughs> and so thank you to everybody who's kind of working in the background to help us get through them. There is maybe one more that just popped up, of course. Um, this is, um, so some people I think jumped on late. There were some redundant questions to things that had already been answered. So I would also recommend that people maybe go back um, and watch again later. Um, if you missed any, we're also, we've got someone taking notes today and we will also share the, um, the document with the, with the takeaways from today. There will be a recording available from today and there will also be notes available. So, um, uh, so stay tuned. It usually takes us about a day to get this thing, the, the recording downloaded and uploaded again and, and um, to you. So uh, by tomorrow, if you, um, I shared it earlier, but if you uh, go to my website, it's middlesexchildren.org. And then uh, the homepage is the COVID-19 resource guide. It's right up on the homepage. I will share it again with you guys, the link. Um, but if you go there, you scroll down to past meetings and webinars. And, um, and then that's where um, both the notes and video from the last time Nathaniel was with us, which was in July, um, and, and from this time we'll both be there. So, um, so that's that. Okay, um, Meryl, did you uh, have anything that you wanted to jump in on first before we keep going? Mm. No, okay. That's all right. And Liz, you're okay. Oh, wait, hold on. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Explain that again. I was just writing something in the chat. What did you just ask? I asked if you had an update you wanted to give. Um, I think that, did, Meryl, the only update that we really have is that we're still looking to get $50 billion out of the federal government. And our country is in a real, um, in a real upheaval right now between everything going on. But we can't take our eye off the prize. There's some talk that Republicans are, um, and this was from Senator Blumenthal. Um, let me just tell you that first. We were with Senator Blumenthal in Middletown um, with the Y and Town and Country Child Care Centers, which was great. And he, he did say that a lot of people in Republican states are talking to their senators and there may be some movement on child care. And after that, there was a report that um, that the Republicans may be putting money um, either into that skinny bill that we talked about that didn't have any childcare in it or separately, I'm not sure, no one really knows, but they're considering childcare money again. And now the problem will be the amount that's going in. Um, a lot of the, 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 the more conservative members in that party are really concerned that our deficit is too big and might not think that childcare needs that sort of funding. I think everybody on the call knows that that funding um, will barely support us. It sounds huge, but we know when we look at what we'll get in Connecticut, it will keep us going for a while, which is really good, but it will not solve the underlying foundational issues, which I keep, you know, we're all reminding you of that. So we'll prop, if we have an alert, we'll send it out to you. If there are other things to do, we'll let you know. But meanwhile, you should know what's going on um, federally. So, yeah, so anything else? Um, federally, the issue is that the federal budget ends at the end of September and the new one starts in October. Um, the, they have not passed a budget for the coming fiscal year yet. So 
and the um, Senate is not back into session until the middle of September. That means they have two weeks to deal with any kind of COVID relief package and to address the, um, the fact that there's not a, a state, and there's not a federal budget. What they are likely to do is to pass a continuing resolution, a CR, um, that keeps things at the current levels uh, to get them um, through to the point where they give them more time to be able to pass a real budget. Um, and they may be doing this all in one bill where they do a continuing resolution plus uh, whatever COVID relief package they're gonna do um, and have one vote on it um, before the end of September. So there are lots and lots of issues competing for the attention of legislators right now. Um, and so it is important that we all continue to reach out to members of Congress so that um, our issue does not get lost in the noise. Um, so um, if anything has changed at your center or you just haven't been in touch with your member of Congress recently, your two senators and your representative in Congress, um, please reach out to them. Send an email, um, make a phone call, tell them you know, what's going on. If you're operating at 60% capacity and you're losing money, let them know that. If you've got staff who won't come back because of concerns about health um, and you're struggling to find staff, let them know that. All of those things, they need to understand that child care is in a, um, a dicey situation right now and we really need help and it needs to get included in this next package before the election. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see. Um... There's a question we have here that says the OEC updated the group size to 16 in an email dated 820 and said a formal memo would be coming out. Has anything come out yet? Programs are waiting to enroll families until the OEC makes this change formal. Have you heard anything, Merrill, Liz, Ava? Um, I heard that they were going to increase it, but I haven't seen a, I haven't gone to look to see if there was a formal memo, just the letter that I saw earlier. Um, right now? Okay. Um, so, well, no, they're not, they, they were, but I don't, I'm not sure. I can't see in the attendees. Uh, I'd have to look through. Um, look. Maggie was here earlier, but I don't, I think she's not here now. Um, Ava has an update. I'm gonna let you go ahead next, Ava. We can't hear you. So this. about four months ago when COVID was. Ava, you're Let's chopping. See. Not good connection. Can you fix it somehow? Can you, can you hear me? Is that yeah. any better? Yes. Is that better? Okay. So four months ago, we, in order to help providers connect with parents, SCIU International came out with a software called Karina Care. Karina is a nationwide child care and home care provider software that connects the consumer, in our case, the parent, with the provider who's providing care. Uh, this software is free for the parent and free for the provider. I'm giving the update because we did a soft launch four months ago where we advertised to a smaller group of people, of parents, to make sure that the system wasn't overwhelmed. Uh, it was a success, and many of you on the call now who are licensed providers were able to create profiles, access the account, connect with parents, and then some other who created the accounts wondered, well, I never got a call from a parent. I was never connected with a new child. Uh, what happened. So for those of you who created that profile and never quite got a contact from a parent that was a successful uh, pairing, so that way you could have someone in your, in a new child in your daycare home, it was most likely because we weren't fully advertising and we weren't open um, nationwide. This was a soft launch. Now that should change. We are opening the floodgates to everyone and anyone. So if you created a Karina profile already, uh, just be on the lookout these uh, next two weeks. We're, we're doing Facebook marketing. We're also going to be do online marketing. We're in conversation with Beth Bai uh, for an email blast. Hopefully, if her team is, is a go um, for an email blast to parents on the OEC um, uh, listserv. Um, hopefully, I can also connect with Liz to do the same with uh, sort of that cause has. But just 
kind of prepare you that if you do get contacted by a parent to not delay, software is only, technology can easily connect to the parent, you have to provide Okay, I'm going to actually move on. I'm sorry, Ava, but we can't hear you and it's just um, making it too whole. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me put, unmute yourself and try again. Where did I leave off? Um, parents and caregivers. Okay, so just, just I'll sum it up with you have to make sure that on the app, whenever you're using technology to get new clientele, that you're on the app and you're connecting with that potential client, with that parent, so you can have a child. So be on the lookout for emails from us and make sure that you're, you're connecting with the parents on Karina Care, okay? Uh, Ava, can you tell us where do people access the Karina Care software and can you share links in the chat? I can, I can share a link on the chat, uh, just to be very specific. As of now, the Karina Care link is only open to licensed providers. Uh, we have not expanded to center care as of now, and we have sent the link to any provider who's within the SEIU CSEA symptom, uh, sy system. Sorry about that. Okay. Thanks, Ava. Um, Meryl and Liz, can I, can I go back? We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, there's um, questions about increasing numbers in home daycares, um, any emphasis on infants and toddlers, people are really struggling with low enrollment. Um, anything to add to that? Yes. So um, during the summer, child, uh, family child care can take three kids who are school age and um, under the current um, uh, executive order, um, that is allowed. You can do that even though school has started. However, that executive order ends pretty soon. And what that means is that uh, the state legislature needs to reconvene and extend the governor's executive authority um, to uh, waive rules. And so that is a a reason why all of you should be contacting your state legislators. Now, I was before I was talking about your members of Congress in Washington, but your state representative and your state senator um, are the people who are going to have to vote on an extension of the governor's executive authority. Um, and that is important for being able to waive rules that um, otherwise get in the way of things. Um, so, you know, one of those rules, for instance, might be, um, you know, for a state funded center, uh, you have a requirement that everybody be working. Well, um, after the last, uh, after our session with the governor, the governor thought it was kind of silly that we weren't supporting um, a, a job search. Now, he didn't really understand what that costs or anything, but one of the places where we could change this is we know that the um, infant toddler care, particularly in the state funded centers, is having trouble with enrollment. Um, and so if you could open that up to parents who were in a job search because the restaurant they used to work at closed down, um, then that would make it easier to enroll people. Um, it's also important for family child care because to be able to extend that rule that you could take a couple of school age or three school age kids um, during school hours, because those are the kids in the hybrid model who aren't at school that day, um, you would need to, that executive order needs to be in effect to waive that rule and to keep it rule, waived. So- um, John is reminding us that the legislature doesn't vote to extend the governor's executive order. The entire legislature. So that means that they'll do um, a like small group of legislators who will go in and do it. Leadership. John, you can you can put it in the chat, or I can also call on you if you'd like to speak. You could um, chat me if you'd like to speak, John. Um, there's a couple. Oh, call on me. Okay, hold on one second, John Catalan. Okay, 
All right, John, you should be allowed to talk, but you're muted. Uh, there you go. Make sure your language. Can you hear me? Yep. Here. You can hear. Okay. So the way it works is the governor, when he first put up the first state of emergency, by law, he has six months. So he was granted six months. Within that, there is a special committee made up of the six legislative leaders, the co-chairs of the public health committee and the ranking members of the public health committee. So there's 10 members on this special committee. The governor can request to extend the state of emergency and that special committee of 10 then has two days to say no. And it's as simple as that. Uh -huh. Okay. They do not have to call in the entire legislature. Thank you for that uh, clarification. No Thank problem. You. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few other things I would like to, were you finished, Meryl? Or did you have more to say about that? Um, nope, that's... Okay. So um, first, um, Diala uh, Ramirez has um, put a, uh, well, it's more of a statement than a question, but um, has not received payment from the Essential Children Program. They've been going back and forth with OEC. Um, there's an investigation at OEC to figure out what's going on. But then Ava also let me know that there are, um, uh, there, this is something that is happening to, to other people as well. And so one thing that Ava is suggesting is that if you guys, let's see, if you chat Ava privately, um, if this is an issue for you, then she is collecting stories around this. Um, uh, so that she can bring that information back to OEC in a bundle. So um, if you are somebody who has not received payment from the Essential Children Program, please private chat Ava Bermuda Zimmerman uh, with your name and contact information and she will collect those as a group. So, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, let's see, we have a couple of other questions here. Chetty says that um, licensing was at her center on Friday and told her that the um, the max capacity of 50 percenter was lifted. Um, so uh, she didn't know this, not sure how she missed it, but she wants others to know in case they don't. Um, let's see, Holly is asking a similar question. When can we expect our check from PPE? Um, Wendy asks, when will OEC be back on this call? So I don't know if we have any updates on that. Um, and then the final question, and you can answer any of these is, um, can we take kids that are not going back to school that are school-aged, or are they considered a full-time spot? So those are the three outstanding questions right now. Meryl, do you want to jump in on any of those? Um, so the issue of a student who is not, who is doing all virtual learning, not going back to school at all, um, I think they can be in childcare. The issue is that care for kids cannot pay for them if you are doing instruction. If they are getting all their instruction from their school district as distance learners, then I think Care for Kids will pay for it. Um, so um, I don't, you should talk to your licensing inspector, I think is the, um, the best question. And if it's a Care for Kids issue, you should talk to Care for Kids. Um, and then, if you get an answer that's different than what I just said, please uh, let us know so that we can um, clarify that with OEC. So um, PPE checks, and then when will we have OEC back on? Okay, so um, I had hoped we were gonna be able to get, get uh, Commissioner by this week, but uh, she is not available on Wednesday. Next Monday is um, a holiday, I think. Uh, yes. no. um, and so I will try to see if we can get uh, OEC on a week from Wednesday. Um, we don't have a speaker lined up for this Wednesday. And I know that there are lots of issues going on with, uh, you know, getting kids back to school and getting your centers up and running. So I would suggest that we um, not do uh, something this Wednesday, that we, we go until a week from Wednesday. Yep, that's fine. And we will we will also not be on on Monday on Labor Day. We will be on the fall, you know, on next Wednesday will be our next time we're getting together. Um, and we will see if we can get someone on for next Wednesday. And I'm seeing um, Barbara Warner asked a question about infants and toddlers and struggling with low enrollment. Um, 
I would uh, love to know more about your analysis on why um, you're having uh, so much trouble with enrollment. You know, my suspicions are that uh, the unemployment rate among uh, young parents is much higher than it is in the broader population. Um, and even if one member is, um, of the family is not working, uh, they're no longer eligible for care for kids. Um, and uh, that families who are struggling financially are um, not gonna be spending money on childcare. Uh, um, you know what though, Meryl, that's something that seems to be um, a theme because I think we heard that last week when we were talking, speaking with the governor, um, I think it was Karen maybe that said that. And then also I know that town and country that they said that there are others that have been saying the same thing about infants and toddlers. So maybe we should start collecting stories to look for trends in that. Yeah. If you're having trouble with infants and toddlers, um, we can put our emails in the chat. Just email us with, with your story or your contact information. And then we can start collecting those. Because if this is a trend, we really need to protect those slots and those spaces. Um, and many people can't use those rooms for older children. They would have to all be re-figured, um, right. so. You know, and it's also, I think, natural for people to, um, um, oh, I think I just put my email address in a response to uh, one person rather than to the whole list. If it goes into the, into the Q&A, then everyone has access to it, so that's fine. You're fine there. Um, so if, if Rhonda is saying if the governor doesn't extend the waiver by the 8th of September, home-based providers will be in trouble. Um, <clears throat> keep an eye on kindergarten, keep an eye on hiked rent. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on out there. I mean, we're seeing some people are <clears throat> writing in that they are planning to close. I mean, I know, I know this is really hard. Um, so that's why we're going to keep, keep this up. Um, so any information on DCF and payments, I can say that um, Georgia is not on today, but um, Meryl, did you have an update on that? So DCF thinks that they have paid all of the outstanding bills. Mm. What that says to me is that there are a lot of bills that, uh, that people have submitted that they don't feel like they can process because they don't have enough information, it wasn't done right, whatever. Um, it says to me that their system was too complicated in the first place, but we are still working on trying to get DCF to come on and um, address the fact that we got so many people who feel like they're owed money who uh, aren't getting paid right now. Right. Um, a suggestion that we invite on um, the Education Commissioner, Miguel Cardona, I think that's a great suggestion. So we will look into the possibility of that. Um, <clears throat> any news on raising Let's see, so another, any news on raising ratios from 16 for preschool and pre-K? I think we said, no, we have no news on that yet, but that they, OEC has said that they plan to, but they have not yet as far as we're aware. Is that accurate? Um, wait a I, let me just look at my email. I... Okay. Um, and then another question, um, is that part of our six full-timers? I think this maybe goes to the school age question, but um, actually everyone, if you ask questions, make sure you reiterate, because it's hard for me to tell who they came from and it doesn't always show them in a linear way. So sometimes people will respond to me, but I don't know what it's connected to. So make sure you say with regards to blank, and then you can put your next question. That helps me a lot. Um, but it says, is that part of our six full timers or can they be here full time counted as our before and after? Are we allowed nine full timers in home daycare like they were through the summer? Does anyone know if they've, if they've announced that? So that is um, still the rule, but that rule will end with the governor's um, executive order. So if it's not renewed, then it goes back to the normal non-summer rule. Um, that's that's why it's really important that the governor's uh, emergency right. powers be extended. I think that um, I believe that the governor knew that on our phone call with him and had mentioned that he knew that that was an important thing and that Commissioner Bai had also been uh, um, talking to him about that. So. And going, going back to the question about group size, 
OEC increased group size from 14 to 16. Um, uh, looks like on the 20th of August. Um, I think that they're going to leave it there for a while because they want to see what happens when schools go back into session and whether we have um, an uptick in infections. Um, so, you know, I just think that that's, um, that is an ongoing issue. Uh, um, we, we are supposed to wrap up in a, just a few minutes. I want to get a couple of things, a couple more things out of the way. There's a question about whether OEC will require masks in preschools. I've heard that they are um, looking into how they're going to deal with that and that they may have an announcement sometime this week about it. So um, that's what we've heard. And we'll, we'll see as soon as that is obviously um, anything solid is about that. We will, we will let you all know. Um, actually, I'm going to call on um, Julianne. Hold on. Let me see. Julianne. Julianne, why don't you, um, you should be, if you unmute yourself and your language settings are correct, you should be allowed to speak now. Julianne, I'm not hearing you. So can you just double check that you've checked English and mute original audio? We're still not hearing you, Julianne. Okay, uh, go into your English. You can hear her. Okay, so this is a, a language settings thing then. That's interesting. I'll, tur I'll turn off my feed and then. About the school age slots, if they count in the six or if they can be the additional three. And she said, she checked with the supervisor and got back to me at the end of that day. And um, they said that if the child is quote unquote homeschooled, like pulled out of um, enrollment in the public schools, they count in your six kids. If the child is, and my specific question related to a Danbury child that's full-time remote learning, if the child's enrolled in the public school and full-time remote learning or part-time, they can count as your school-aged kids. So they can be the additional three kids. They don't have to count in the, the six kids okay. if they're doing remote learning. But again, the same um, thing, they're getting their education from through the schools right. so that they're in line with the care for kids. Yeah. I see. Okay, thank you, Julianne. Um, thanks for, for that. And you know, to all of you, if you have information that you think we need to hear, you know, you're always welcome to private chat me and I'll, and I'll call on you if, if I can. A um, couple more. So Meryl, somebody is saying, you might not have answered the question about PPE Kickstart. Um, that may be actually a, more of an Ava question because she's working on that, but do you have anything to offer? No, I just wrote in the answer, which is that's a OEC question, not you know, we don't control those funds. So um, we will work to get OEC on to answer those questions. Okay. Um, and if anyone has a contact, contact information for the supplies bonuses, if you could put it into the chat for, to everyone. Um, Manaz is asking for that. So that would be a thing that we need. Um, okay. So with real quick, when, with regards to nine full-timers and family daycare, um, I think that's what we already talked about, right? We're waiting for the executive order. Am I, am I getting that right? Yeah. I don't, I don't totally understand what this question is, but I think we answered it. So I'm going to leave that one. Um, in terms of the COVID tests, I mean, this is an interesting, I have an 18 month old baby that's going to travel out of the country. Should he get the COVID test done when he comes back? Um, I think it's a, it's a two, two week quarantine. Well, the question is where they're going. If they're going to some place that has a high infection rate, like Brazil, um, that's very different than if you're going to a place with a very low infection rate like New Zealand. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, if they would qualify as uh, meeting the um, requirements, you know, if, if they were going to Alabama, they would have to quarantine when they came back. Look at the governor's guidance on infection rates um, to qualify for quarantine and then um, 
You could look at the um, uh, globalepidemic.org, I think it is, uh, website that uh, tells you about it in other places as well. I'm also uh, going to put into the chat what the, um, the, the State of Connecticut Travel Advisory page. So you can click there and just look. Um, you, you can look and see what the best advice at this moment is. Um, Carol Weisberg is um, mentioning that um, on the masks, school readiness providers have been told that guidelines will recommend masks for two years and older, but official OEC guidance hasn't been sent yet. So I just wanna put that out there. Um, also want to say, um, Caroline is sharing uh, sad news that uh, she will be closing her center September 25th in Ansonia. I wish that wasn't happening and maybe there's a way you can, I don't know, I don't know what can happen, but that is terrible and I'm so sorry to hear that. But also I think what she wants this community to know is that she has a lot of supplies for sale if anyone needs them. So um, things in nice condition, she writes in the, in the chat. So um, her email is in the chat. I'm gonna point you to that. Um, if that's something that you either can help her stay open or if you are interested in her things. So um, that, that is in, in the chat today. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, Carolyn, that's terrible. Um, the, uh, someone else is saying that since the increase in COVID in children has been mostly from infected parents, the whole family should get tested if they travel abroad before letting the children return. Um, I think we're wrapping up. Meryl, Liz, Ava, do you have any last things to share? Um, I know that uh, NIAC is trying to um, keep track of centers that closed and collect stories from programs that close. As um, horrible as it is that a center is closing, it is important that those stories get captured so that public policy uh, leaders can understand the problem um, and understand that it's, it's real. Um, and that's, this is what we're fearing about lots of child care centers. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, so the last thing I will say to those of you who are here, who are here still is that we will be sharing uh, the notes from today's webinar with you and also the recording. Um, I think that the way to think about this best is to always go back to what is primary. Don't get so stuck in air purifiers and filters and this, what kind of fan it is. I think that advice Nathaniel gave, which is think about the primary problem, which is we really need fresh air circulation. And so whatever it takes for you to be able to get that fresh air circulation into your space, that is what you should be prioritizing. And that mask wearing is really the best guidance at this point about how to prevent both the spread and the um, catching of the virus. And so masks, 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 to the extent that you can um, enforce or, um, or have obviously staff should all be wearing them. Um, the face shields can be useful if you have a crying baby in your arms, if you're changing diapers, you know, put that on for those moments. But if you're, you know, supervising a group, they're all on the floor, they're playing, the face shield is probably not necessary under those conditions because you're in very low risk at that point. But masks 100% of the time, uh, the idea of changing out the masks if possible, um, the cotton ones are, are fine, you know, not the ones with those removable valves, um, and, and just always prioritizing fresh air when possible. So um, Liz, did you have something to, to jump in on? Was that okay? Um, I'm all, all set, I was just saving the chat. Great, okay, so thank you. Um, Meryl, go ahead. Um, think about the fact that um, when kids are eating, they, by necessity, have to take the masks off. Um, while the weather is still nice, as much as you can picnic outside, that is better. And um, particularly when the kids have their masks off, you as a provider, should keep your mask on, especially if you're inside. Um, because you are actually, you know, little kids are not getting affected by this as badly as adults. And so protect yourselves. Make sure you wear a mask. And is the other more thing then as well, and that's about the census. We have one month if every single child care provider could make sure by speaking with your parents um, 
you know, maybe in that morning check, the afternoon check, whatever, that your parents have signed up for the census and have counted all their children. It's so important. We are going to lose funding in the, the communities that need it the most. And we are also going to lose our legislative delegation. We are way behind in many cities, even though Connecticut is doing pretty well totally, not so much for children. And we really need to look at all of our kids and make sure everyone is counted. And I will put something on the listserv today about it, but we need to really make sure every single day that we are um, asking the parents over and over and, if, and, um, and asking them for the census. Merrill, do you have the census information to put in the chat? There's a phone number they can call to do it. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, a phone number or a, or an, or a, um, or a link. So that phone number, 844-330-2020, is a toll-free number that people can call. They have multiple different languages available, and you can do the census on the phone with a real person. Um, and so particularly people who don't have access to the internet, that is the easiest, simplest way to do it. Yep, okay. So thanks everyone. We are not gonna be meeting on Wednesday. Uh, have a healthy, productive week. Um, I hope that you are still able to um, prioritize yourself, your own mental health, your own wellness. Take that time for yourself. We know that's so important. So to the extent that you can, um, I hope that you have a, a peaceful and well week and a restful weekend. We will not see you Monday as it's a holiday, but we will see you Wednesday. I hope you're able to have some fun, not too close to other people on Labor Day. <laughs> Protect yourself on Labor Day too. And we'll see you again next Wednesday. Thanks so much. Have a great one.